Well, everyone listening, we're super, super excited to have Greg Sterling and lucky to have Greg Sterling join us to talk about this massive news item coming about the Google monopoly. I first met Greg, or I first learned of Greg back in 2006 when I started Avo. I, I got my hands on everything he had written, and one of my first objectives was to get Avo on Greg's radar. Uh, Greg is, is the, I will call him the OG of digital local, right? And no one knows more about this space than Greg. He's been studying it forever. And he also... And I think it was, Greg, it was, it was back in 98 when you were practicing law. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I did civil litigation for about nine years, and I hated every minute of it. Uh, <laughs> I learned a lot, but I hated every minute, minute of it. So it, my, I'll, uh, my, my legal skills are a little rusty here, but I'll do my best. Okay, and then you presciently went into digital marketing before anyone was really thinking about this, right? Well, I mean, I, I, I was really a, a, a sort of an editorial research person, and then I got pushed into an analyst role. And so I became, I think I have the, I mean, your, 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 uh, your introduction is very flattering, and I don't want to be self-congratulatory, but I think, I think I wrote the very first report, and this may be wrong, but this is my memory, on whether or not search engines would uh, destroy the Yellow Pages industry. Right. And back in, back in like... 2000 and you know one or something like that 2002 and, and it was an open sure question yeah, yeah believe it or not i can't find it anymore you know it's like i was looking for it it was like 85 pages or something and believe it or not it was an open question in those days now it seems like a stupid question to ask but it was a it was not a, a foreground conclusion so let's get into the question is the department of justice going to destroy google now the the new yellow pages right can you give a quick overview of of the ruling and what happened and where we are today? Well, I mean, the ruling was almost 300 pages, so I can't do it justice here. But basically, uh, the judge in the D.C. Circuit Court, the federal court, found that the, you know, he had to define the markets first. And then he found that there were two markets that were relevant to the conversation, general search and then search text advertising. And he found that Google was a monopoly in general search and that it used that monopoly status to um, basically extract sup supra, I think he said supra, like the Toyota Supra, competitive profits from uh, text advertising, that it could raise prices with impunity and that it acted to maintain its monopoly. You know, it acquired the monopoly through innovation, but it acted in improper ways like default search agreements and other ways to maintain that monopoly. And that allowed it to raise prices on advertisers and get, you know, all this this revenue without regard to competitors. And Guy or Greg, do you guys buy the argument that Google's is is a monopoly and also is acting like it? Well, yes. I, you know, yeah, I, I, my, my thing, and we were talking about this in the pre-show, um, you know, who cares what I think, really? I, I think the, the interesting and thing to me- all of our listeners. Now, they, who cares? It's, they're, they're a monopoly. They can appeal. Some, there's going to be some remedy. Uh, and, I, and I think that that's going to be, that's the thing that people are curious. When they read this, you know, I, you know, I think most people that hear this headline, I don't think that they're really going to the nuances of like whether Google's a monopoly or not. I mean, I think everybody knows everybody Google's a verb. Everybody's using Google. You know, everybody knows this anecdotally, like there are other search engines out there, but unless you're in the industry or unless you're like some kind of superpower user, you're not using DuckDuckGo, you're not using Bing. You know, we can talk about some of this the AI options, perplexity and stuff like that. But everybody everybody's using Google, right? To me, and, and this is the thing that I that I'm so curious about everybody's kind of perspective on is, is, you know, one, I think it's fair to say, like, well, what's what's the government going to do? Um, and that can range. I think it's pretty clear. Well, Greg, what, we have you here. What do you think the some of the most like the more likely remedies that we're going to see? Like, do you think the well, government's going to break them up? It be, Yeah, before before I say that, I just want to say that, um, you know, a lot of people uh, hear the word monopoly and they think that's that's an illegal category and it's really not i mean what's what's illegal is what do you do with that monopoly if you act to abuse that power if you abuse your market control then that's the real that's the real injury that they're trying to remedy but um uh you know the 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 finding that google is a monopoly or an illegal monopoly or acted illegally is really just a symbolic thing unless we unless we have some you know some meaningful remedies and so to that to that question which you just asked 
I mean, I think at the highest level, there's like three things. You know, breaking up Google, a structural remedy that would would seek to divest parts of Google, separate the search business from the ad business, something like that, for example. Um, we we could potentially see the end of the default search agreements, like the the twenty plus billion dollar uh, agreement between Google and Apple, and to a lesser degree, Google and Mozilla and some others. I think DuckDuckGo is part of that. Uh, and then we might see something like. Google being forced to turn over a lot of its search data to to rivals to to give them some additional um, you know uh, data that they can use to improve their their own products. I mean, this was one of the points of the of the case is that Google was hoarding data. The default search agreement allowed it to collect so much more data, uh, among other things, than than its rivals that it could it could improve continue continuously improve the search relevancy of its results. And 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 others like Bing, which is what Satya Nadella, CEO of Bing, uh, CEO of Microsoft, testified to. They couldn't compete with that. They just didn't have enough data. So that might be one of the remedies that Google has to turn over certain kinds of data to to others. Hey, and there Greg, may be a, others. Yeah. Big, big picture question on that. So you, you talked about the data and and using that data to improve the um, the results, right? And turning over that data could, you know, ostensibly make the other alternatives more effective. Do, is, is there, just from a pure large picture market research perspective, I know there's a consumer perspective that the Google results are, are superior. Is, does that actually pan out in the research? You're saying like third parties who who test the relevancy of Google's yeah, research. Yeah, like is you know is 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 Google that much better than Bing that that, some, that no one should bother with with working with Bing, right? You know, I, I I'm I, that's not something I reviewed prior to coming here, but my my right. sort of seat of the pants response to that question is is no. I mean, yes, Me Google. So so in in so in the local space, which you you know that's where my initial expertise was in the local space, definitely yes. Google has the best local data set of anybody. And that ironically becomes one of their chief competitive differentiators and assets. But in the broad search context, like just general information queries and yep. you know other stuff, no. I would say that there's, there's increasing evidence and there's certainly a lot of anecdotal experience and evidence that suggests Google is maybe incrementally better in certain kinds of situations, but no, not, not, it's not head and shoulders above everybody else. Okay. Okay. No, I, I I would agree with that. I just it, it it's a Gee, what do you what do you think about that? What's your experience? Yeah, I I, I mean I again I'm I'm so uh, tainted um because you know we closely monitor search results and when you see at, le at least when you look at Google versus Google it looks pretty rough to me. I mean, you know, it's we've got the Reddit stuff. Um you know, we were seeing even to the point about map packs, like, you know, and Google's constantly testing stuff, but, you know, there'd be times where they'd have Forbes was the best result for car accident lawyers near me. And I'm like, come on, you got all this other data. You can't come up with a better listing than Forbes is paid, you know, uh, pay to play directory um, as the number one spot. And so, but versus other search engines, like, especially in local, for sure, Google. Um, I think query for query, like, yeah, I, I think the average person, there's not a discernible difference, but I, I look, I, I think it, I think that the arguments that Google has a huge advantage by being able to use this, uh, you know, user data, click data across Chrome and across all these it's default using, installs. Yeah. yeah. It has massive click data, Chrome, you know, it's tracking people on Chrome, the sites they visit, they've got search data, they're combining all those data sets. You know, absolutely. That's a huge advantage. And I think that, you know, we can debate whether or not that's playing out, um, you know, as like making Google's results that much better, but certainly competitive advantage. And and, I, and again, I think you know, I'm thinking about the, the lawyer who's listening to this sh show and they're like, okay, I got it. Uh, Google now has uh, been accused of, uh, is a monopoly and is unfairly perpetuating its monopoly. And in real at the, at the heart of some of the uh, arguments is this idea about default. What's the default, right? So you buy a phone. What's the default search engine? And that's the thing that I'm super curious about because again, if I'm a 
if I'm an advertiser on Google, I'm a small business, or I'm, I've been relying on organic uh, business through their search results, what's this mean for me? And so I'll, I'll stop there. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for us, maybe short term and maybe intermediate term? And of course, a lot of this is dependent on what the remedies are. But I think that's like the real heart of the question that I think people are wondering. Is that is that my question to answer, Conrad? Yeah. You want sure. to weigh in? No, no, no. have at it. Yeah. We we need your brain. Yeah, well, I've I've only had one cup of coffee this morning, so I think that's my dis- <laughs> that's my disclaimer. Um, you know, I think the remedy is everything, right? In this situation, it's like wh- how you know there's a spectrum. How how strong is that remedy going to be, and what's going to happen? I mean, the judge, you know, just to digress for a moment. In the in the Microsoft case 25 years ago, Microsoft was found to be an illegal monopoly. The judge uh, at the trial court level, same level as this one, said we need to break up the company into different different units, um, and uh, that got overturned on appeal. And then the Bush administration, first the uh, George W. Bush administration, 2000 came in, and settled the case. Nothing happened, right? So even if there is a, a strong remedy here, breaking up the company, separating the ad business from the search business. We could see an outcome where nothing happens to Google at all. Now, putting that aside, that scenario aside, I think from a marketer perspective, you, it's business as usual into the foreseeable future, right? It's, it's nothing is really going to change for marketers, search marketers, and for businesses in the, on the organic side trying to get visibility on Google. Um, I, I, that's the, that's the de facto situation. Google, Google owns the brand. I mean, it's interesting, you know, you, you talked about Forbes. Um, the reason that people that Forbes is up there is because of clickstream data, right? People see the Forbes brand, they recognize it as a familiar brand, they click on it, that perpetuates Forbes visibility. Google has that data, it keeps pushing, putting Forbes in the top results because users seem to like it. It's this weird it's sort of feedback enough. loop. Yeah, exactly. That's the AJ Cohn point. It's the it's the it's the uh, it's the feedback loop that clicks clicks provide. I don't think I don't think we see any any change in the near term. Uh, to to how marketers or how search you know SEOs operate because I think Google will remain in the position that it's in. Let me ask That's you a short on that. The you know you, we're talking about the the marketers and the advertising. You talked about organic. You were right with the use of the word super competitive. I'll read it. Importantly, the court also finds that Google has exercised its monopoly power by charging super competitive prices for general search text ads. This conduct has allowed Google to earn monopoly profits. Guy and I have been whining increasingly loud where we've gone from whining to, to kind of yelling about the 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 costs of advertising and the rising cost of pay-per-click advertising do you anticipate changes to that like is is advertising going to get more cost effective because they they're gonna have to back off on some of their tactics that they've been using to, to drive these super competitive prices well, one of the one of the things that we saw in the in the antitrust tr- trial was the idea that this, this, the ad side talking to the to the search the organic search people saying, "Hey, we're not right. going to make our quarter, quarterly numbers unless we <laughs> we juice this somehow," and they were just raising prices to make the numbers right. I mean, right? The, they were. I mean, that was one of the most infuriating pieces of evidence is they were just manipulating things behind the scenes so they could please Wall Street. I don't I don't know, Conrad, whether there's any mechanism in the market. I don't know what the court would do to to uh, bring down prices uh, for for text advertising PPC ads um, and and there's no immediate competitive pressure to do that so I don't know how that happens I mean that's one it clearly at the core of this of this decision is Google can just raise prices whenever it wants no nobody can do anything about it and I think that's happening in LSAs you would know that more absolutely yeah and so I don't know what you do to you know you do you impose caps on that do you do you ask for some sort of transparency thing? I, I don't know what the mechanisms are to to other than competition to to impact that. And we don't really have competition unless there was somebody else with market share. I mean, there is competition from social media and from sure. display and from other channels, but not in search. Right. Not in search. Um, this has been so this you, is an awesome conversation. Let's take a quick break. And we're back, and we are again joined by Greg Sterling. Um, and Greg at Near Media, which all by the way, we talk about Near Media all the time on the show. We love Near Media, all the good work you all put out. Um, you published, uh, and we'll put a link to this in the show notes. Google losses, AI ankle biters, and GBP menu optimization. And, and one of the things you said in your take, and this really goes picking up from the conversation before the the break, is 
what's going to happen here? Remedies and will it create competition? So you write, um, default search deals are now probably dead, which means billions lost for Apple, but could really impact Mozilla Firefox. It might also jumpstart Apple's move into search, especially given Apple's intelligence. So let's so default search. Let's just say that that's that's really ultimately what happens here. They don't do the breakup. The default search deal's dead. The competitors now, and, th- and I think that's the, what the court's really going for here, is how can we actually drive more competition in the search space? Talk to us about, one, just kind of like your you, what your kind of thoughts on the current search space market are, and, and maybe what kind of impact just the default search deal being dead. So, you know, maybe, right. they're, maybe they sw- they're switching to users on all devices get to, they ask, you know, which search engine do you want to use as your default at the at the outset what do you what do you think this does to the search market space if anything so um i think if there's a if there's a choice uh screen or 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 you know when somebody sets up a new phone or something they have to choose a search engine which is kind of the european model browser choice i think people choose google you know maybe google loses a few people through that but basically people choose google an interesting uh, thing that came out recently was Google's, Google Google t- attempting to move people off Safari to its own apps on the iPhone, trying to move iPhone users away from Safari to its own search search app, and it was not successful. You know, for the most part, that was the that was the the internal data that Google did not have great success trying to migrate people to its search app. So that's a really interesting data point. Um, that doesn't mean people don't just use Google, you know, don't use the Safari browser and then just use Google. But but that was kind of interesting, suggesting that, um, you know, maybe there's a, an option if Apple then comes in and really does a search engine and that becomes the default on Safari, there might be some, some market share impact. Now, Apple, one of the findings of the court in this case was Google's payments to Apple was a disincentive for Apple to develop its own search engine, which is part of the anti-competitive stuff. So, Apple, but for these payments, would p- possibly have developed a search engine. It sort of has a quasi-search capability now, but not exactly. And so the court may think, well, by killing the default agreements, we're going to motivate Apple now to go into search in 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 earnest. And there's an interesting, you know, mo- this is an interesting moment with Apple bringing in, you know, AI capabilities to Siri and then, you know, b- more broadly to the iPhone. And they they had a thing called Spotlight Search, which was sort of a search on your phone, and then it would give you websites. But, you know, I don't think people used it that much. I don't know what the data are. Um, But there is an interesting opportunity for Apple, uh, and Apple could potentially compete in local better than other people, but it remains to be seen. So I think Apple is a possibility now, and a lot of people on the iPhone would use it if it was, you know, if it was sort of integrated in a way that made it really convenient and good enough to use but we'll see i mean i i i'm not i'm not hopeful that there's going to be some big competitive impact on google well the other so thing that you oh go ahead conrad no no you're fine the other thing that you mentioned and, and this is kind of like the um i don't know if it paradox is probably too strong but so the court's like we're going to try to do some things to make the search landscape more competitive. That might mean this, def- you know, getting rid of the defaults. It might mean some data sharing so like some of these other search engines can actually compete better for a better product. But then we come back to this idea that Google's a verb. And so how do you how do you move and what's the likelihood of moving? Now, a lot of people, you know, they look at the data and they, you know, they look at nudge, the default is what has been driving a lot of this, right? Um but, you know, I mean, we were talking about this. I did some anecdotal social media polls and everybody said the same thing you did. They're going to say if the default's Bing, they're going to switch back to Google. But you do write um, that there seems to be this pent up demand for Google alternatives. Kind of talk to us about that. Like, what do you what do you think people are lacking from Google or, or what what moves a competitor to actually impact Google's market share? Um, I think it'll happen, you know, over time if it happens. You know the 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 sort of uh, you know Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, talked about how he wanted to reinvent search, and they've got Search GPT now that they're testing out. And you know, I think that there is an opportunity. You you can't use these AI tools 
uh, without sort of feeling like this is the future somehow. You know that 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 the right. the Google search results as they are constituted, and never never mind the AI overviews, but sort of Google search results page feels like now an artifact of a of an earlier time. And you know Google has obviously got Gemini, and they're putting these AI overviews in 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 results. But what Google's trying to do really is just generate more revenue, more and more revenue. And they've and they've and that that objective is now at odds with producing the best results, producing the best yeah. product. And so so I think there's an opportunity for something different uh, that looks different. It, it it has to look and feel and act different than than you know Bing came along and basically just you know, put a Bing logo on a Google page, kind of, you know, a mo use that as the template. And um, interestingly, uh, I'm jumping around, I realize. So Neva, which was started by um, uh, Sridhar Ramaswamy, who was the number one guy at Google in, uh, in charge of the ad side, I think, maybe all of search, but certainly the ad side, uh, started Neva as an alternative. And it was going to be subscription-based because he became disillusioned with the ad model, you know, seeing all the stuff that was going on. And they 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 finally sold themselves to Snowflake, which is you know the data lake data company, uh, and now he's the CEO. Um, but uh, what they said in shutting down Neva, and they were the first really to put AI overviews in search results ahead of Google and ahead of everybody else, ahead of Perplexity, I think even. Um, they they said it was it was it was harder to get people to switch from Google to try them, just to try them, the free version, than it was to get an existing user to pay them 20 bucks a month. So the paid right. conversion was easier than get, getting people <laughs> off Google, which goes to your point, right? It's just going to get going to be really difficult to get people to to from Google to what seems like knockoff products, right? Bing, DuckDuckGo, you know, um, I don't even know, uh, uh, Yahoo!, whatever, whatever else exists. These these all seem like sort of lesser versions of Google. And so it's going to take something really different and really with a different user experience or that offers just a different value proposition to, to start eating into Google's share and usage. Uh, a recent white paper from uh, Dados, which is a subsidiary of SEMrush, found that there had been no traffic impact or no search volume impact on Google from these AI tools. And it looked right. at ChatGPT being, or not being, but uh, Microsoft Copilot, Gemini, um, Perplexity, and Claude. And what they found was these tools were all growing, but they weren't impacting Google. Perplexity was growing especially. Uh, ChatGPT was the biggest. And it found in total that 16% that of the search user base, 16.4% of the search user base, was using an AI tool. That's where the change comes from, right? And the, and, the, and the analogy that I made was MySpace and Facebook. So MySpace and Facebook coexisted. A lot of people were on MySpace. A lot of people were also on Facebook. And eventually, people stopped using MySpace. There's nothing like that on the horizon for Google. But the people that are on these AI tools, like ChatGPT and you know whatever else, and I use Perplexity, you know, they're doing something and then it's like, oh, I have this question. I'm just going to ask that question right there. Yeah. And that's it's not something they do. They go over and go to Google and ask. I'm doing that right now. My Google usage has dropped by 50%, I would say, since I've been using ChatGPT. And I, and I try to use perplexity and other things. I still use Google, but the frequency and, and intensity of my usage has really declined. And I think there's a, a cohort of people, and maybe it's small, maybe it's sort of medium-sized, that will see migrate to something like that over time. Great. But I Do think in the short that? term, yeah. Do you see that cohort being generational? Like I, I'm, you know, I, I think about Facebook now being the place where, you know, younger people, people are like, oh, well, that's where my grandparents are, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you think, do you think this becomes a generation? Like, are we just like, is, is my generation, this generation stuck using Google as a verb and that's where we will be? And the change happens from a from a different demographic perspective, or do you think there's something that could come along and sweep across the across the landscape? Well, I mean, you, have you guys used the ChatGPT 4.0 voice assistant yep. on the phone, right? So you can just have a conversation with it. Sounds like a human, very natural sounding. You know, it's long winded. Maybe it's yep. more information than you need in certain situations. But once you get hooked into that, that that user experience is just really fresh and different. And it was what Siri was supposed to be. But um, so I think that that will appeal to a certain kind of person, irrespective yeah. of age. I think you're basically right that people, 
who know Google, like Google, are familiar with Google, are just going to keep using it for the most part. Um, I do think that younger people are less attached to Google, less interested yeah. in Google than people our age, certainly not, you know, less, less than SEOs. And that's where this whole social search debate comes from, like the Google, you know, uh, um, uh, Prakabar Raghavan got up in a tech, tech crunch disrupt or, said, or something and said, you know, 40% of young people don't use Google for restaurant search. They use Instagram and TikTok. And then that started right. this whole discussion. And, you know, this this Dados S SEMrush research found that that was social search was a pretty small phenomenon. But there's other data that suggest a lot of younger people do use Instagram, do use uh, do use TikTok to get information they might have used, you know, they might formerly have gotten on Google. And I think that kind of thing goes to the declining quality of Google search results, that, that there's enough people out there that think Google is just not as good as it used to be. It takes more time. It's frustrating. It, there's a lot of noise and spam. I think there is some cohort, I don't know how big it is, that it has a pent up demand for something better and is waiting for that thing to emerge. So you guys took me exactly where I wanted to go. We didn't even plan this, but I, you know, this the this social and search thing, which which is in the they talk about this in the decision. Um, you know, they made the big push that you know people go to social media for entertainment. They don't go there to collect information. And and when and I saw that and I was like, huh? I'm like, that's not right. Um, you know, industry participants do not consider social media sites to be general search engines. I think that's fair, right? We don't think people most people don't think of it as a social media as a search engine. Um, but Google's internal studies suggest that younger users may be increasingly using social media for re for search related needs. So even Google's like, we know they're starting some of the stuff they used to come to Google for. They're getting uh, from social for a lot of the reasons and, you said. And I, that's and young. I think, and that's but, young people. And that's young people. Right. That's yeah. For, Right. And, th and then, but at the same time, Google certainly views these other social media sites as competitors, right? They're, they're taking attention, they're taking ad dollars to, to a certain degree. Um, but the evidence has shown so far that social increased use of social media corresponds, uh, does not correspond to decreased use of Google. And so it, but this is the, this is to me where I think this new pent up thing lives. It's somewhere at the intersection of AI and social, because, you know, to, to your point, one of the challenges of Google is you when you go to a, get a Google result, even if like the result's not that bad, we're developing a bias against like fake reviews and we're developing this right. bias against like there's all these SEOs destroying the internet on Google. But if I go and ask my friend on Facebook for a recommendation, that's from a person that I know, like, and trust. And so now that becomes the the search layer is this filter of social. And, and that to me seems like the interesting thing is like, and, and again, and I know they're not the same, right? Facebook's not a search engine, you know. TikTok's not a search engine, but something about if if Google could have figured out how to actually do social right, that seems to me to be like the big opportunity because you've got this um, this layer of reliability in the people but, you know versus links. Yeah, but you know that that issue came, uh, Conrad. I hope I didn't preempt you. Do you want to respond? No, you're to fine. That I listen. W by the way, everyone's listening is here to listen to you, not me and Geek. So, oh, don't I, say that. Brain, don't say that. The more Greg we get, the better. It's true. No, I, I, well, all right. You guys are, yeah, I'm going to turn red here. But anyway, <laughs> um, that proposition of like your, fr you, you know, people you trust, your friends, your, your network, those people are going to make better recommendations than general search or, you know, sort of these, these anonymous uh, aggregators of data. That, that, that was, that was a, a conversation that was happening years ago. And there were a bunch of people that try and tried to combine search and social in, in different ways, you know, like leveraging your, your network somehow on a third party site, you know, by some Facebook API plugin. Google Plus. And, none of the, Google and Plus, then there was baby. Google I thought you were going to bring Google Plus back. Yeah, Google and Google Plus failed, obviously. And and there there was there was complexity there that I think was just very hard for people to work out. And then there's also also um, uh, next door right has not taken off. That's a logical place for people to ask for recommendations, and some of them do. But it's it that hasn't really emerged as a viable alternative to Yelp or Google as a as a place to find local business information. I mean, some people do it, but. Um, so I, I, and then there was, there were all these answer engines, quote unquote answer engines. Facebook had answers, you know, there's, there's answers.com. There was, there was a company whose name I forgot that Google bought, um, Aardvark, I think it was, 
you know, there were there were all these there were all these the you know uh, um, uh, Biz Stone started one. The, which was supposed to be a social search engine. So there was this whole mo- effort to bring the two together, and none of those uh, succeeded. None of those succeeded. You know, um, uh, Amazon has an answers product that that sort of nobody uses, and it's logical, but it's not. There's been no breakthrough. Now I think I think there's AI creates interesting opportunities to create new new experiences. And then there's also verticals, right? There's a there's a the a thing I wrote about uh, called Mind Mind Trip, which is a a um, AI sort of travel search site where it has a sort of chat interface and and has the Google API data in there, and that's a really interesting user experience. It's pretty slick, and you can just have a single conversation. I want to go to Italy. What should I do? Where should I go? What should I stay? I want you know. Hotel, you can ask a very complicated hotel query, has to have right. this characteristic and that characteristic and ratings and this below this dollar threshold, and it works. And, you know, you sort of don't know if the data is exactly right underneath, but but it works as a user experience. So I do think, Guy, to your point, there is an interesting opportunity. Will anybody break through? You know, there's there's the whole kind of question about VC funding. You know, a lot of VCs, funding dry, dried up for alternatives to Google. You know, people were building search alternatives, and then nobody would fund them after a certain point because there was just this assumption that Google's going to win, and it's, it's you know, it's you're, we're throwing our money away. Will there be funding under the banner of AI for search alternatives now? Perhaps. That's an that's a important question, because if there's no money to build these things, you know, they won't, they obviously won't succeed. All right, looking ahead, Greg. There's there's lots of it's very murky. You you're a you're a law firm, you're growing your law firm. You want to be cutting but not bleeding edge. What would you be looking at? What would you tell a lawyer to look at into the future? Well, like into the near you're, future. You inter- you're talking specifically about the question of how clients, how p- prospective clients will find that lawyer, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, and I so spend I, our, have our career on this. I'd love to, uh, you know. Well, I mean, you, I mean, I think a bigger picture. Well, I th- I think it's all dependent upon what we've been talking about, it, which is wh- who's adopting what thing as a as an information resource. I think you got to keep doing what you're doing on Google for the foreseeable future, and you know all the whatever verticals you guys are telling your clients to focus on at this point. I mean, are there any at this? And I don't know, but so so the the sort of the vertical directories. Google, you know, to a lesser degree, whatever being, and then you then you really have to sort of become, you have to look at AI. You really have to you really have to understand what's there. If people do searches for certain kind of lawyers, right? If people start with a, uh, you know, I have this legal problem, right? My neighbor, I had this is a real situation. A f- friend of mine who lives in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, some people, you know, developer bought the house next door. They're working on it. Neighbors cut down a tree, which was actually on his property by mistake. Big right. tree provides shade and privacy. That's you know that's a major thing. That tree as long they're never going to have that tree again. So he's like, he doesn't know what his remedies are. He doesn't know what his rights are. So he maybe he goes on to ChatGPT and starts saying, "Hey, is somebody cut down a tree? What can I do?" Yep. And that kind of query then ultimately maybe leads him to some specific law firm recommendations. So you really have to know what's going on with legal questions, legal information, uh, you know, informational queries, that kind of thing on, on these, uh, these AI sites, because that ultimately may lead to a, a practitioner query. You know, is there somebody in my area who can help me? Give me the best law firm in Seattle, Washington, or the best law firm in neighborhood XYZ. Right. And so, you, you, you know, that's not going to get you a lot of leads right now, but you you need to sort of see that as maybe one future source and understand how that works. And there are people starting to talk about generative, you know, engine optimiz- yeah. optimization, GEO. Um, and so you, you just need to start familiarizing yourself. That's coming on some level. I don't know how big it'll be. And then also a- a- Apple Business Connect. That's that's been around, but you need to you need to do that, you know, as well because Apple is you know Apple Maps is a tool that people use to find maybe not lawyers, but local business information you should you should be there as well but i would say focus focus on just becoming really familiar with the ai tools perplexity chat gpt not gemini so much i don't think that's going to ever replace google 
um, you know, look at the AI overviews on Google when you do legal queries. Do keyword right. searches for your your type of practice. You know, people, lawyer in your area, whatever practice. You know, legal problem, and see what see what's showing up. Would you recommend something different? What would you guys? You guys are the SEO practitioners. Or well, the marketing I think, I think practitioners. our my big perspective. I think he shares this is the there is if you are dependent on Google for any reason, whether it's because you have big budgets, like you can disappear. The the, the it yep. is such a dangerous thing to be dependent yep. on. It can also be a really expensive thing to be dependent on, um, and right. it's becoming increasingly expensive to be dependent well, on. So, so to step back, sorry to sorry no, to no. cut you off. No, to step go. back, to step back, you should be developing a brand. You know, you should be you should be. I mean, this is right exactly. This is this is old advice, but yeah. give educate people, give them useful information. You know, if you're if you're so inclined, get on TikTok and answer legal questions in your area. Create you know create content that is helpful to people and build your brand so that you are people when people go to Google they're searching for your brand because they've heard about you somewhere else and don't compete against the millions of people who are, you know, divorce lawyer Los Angeles or whatever. Right. Don't compete in that space. I I 100%. It's, it's so fantastic. Fantastic. That's all you can do. I mean, you you got to wean yourself off of Google. You you know, you can't ignore Google. You got to play in that. You got to swim in that pond or whatever the metaphor is. But you've got to you've got to use other channels including first party, you know, email, whatever, whatever to build a brand and build your expertise and be a helpful, you know, be a helpful provider of information. And so when people, you know, when people are looking for you, you're you're there. They've heard of you. Somebody recommends you. Um, don't be just some anonymous guy who's, you know, who's who's competing with ten thousand others in the same Love segment. It. And that's the thing: brand helps SEO, right? Yes, people talk ironically. About you. Yeah, right. We, you know, people are searching on your name; they're clicking on uh, results, uh, disproportionate clicks with uh, brand queries. Yeah, um, all the things that we know. That's to me that the best SEO is brand. And and there was a great there was a great, great uh, sort of anecdote case study that Miriam Ellis, who is no longer with Moz but used to do a lot of the local content for Moz, um, wrote about about Ace Hardware, and somebody on Twitter said, "Hey, why does Ace even still exist with H? You know, with uh, Home Depot and Lowe's with such better prices? Blah blah blah." And there were all these people, all these devoted Ace Hardware fans, who came back and said, "This is why I shop at Ace." And mostly it was about. Uh, it was about user experience. It was about the store experience, helpful customer service. And it was also about sort of the personality of the brand versus these more generic corporate entities. And so, you know, this is not directly analogous to the legal profession because you don't have ongoing business, hopefully, with lawyers. I mean, maybe if you're tr uh, 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 yeah, transactional. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 you know, you know, stuff that you do in the real world in, in the community, you know, also comes back online. If you're holding educational seminars, if you're doing meetups, you know, if you're giving people information about whatever your practice expertise is, that kind of offline activity can show up online in terms of recommendations, That's brand right. familiarity, you know, do 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 the best job you can with service and you know that shows up in reviews, but it also shows up in people doing offline word of mouth recommendations. You know, if you've done a great job servicing your customer, your client, people are going to do, you know, word of mouth is the most trusted source of referrals. If you play to that, you know, you're going to get clients and those clients will start showing up online with reviews and with recommendations. It, 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 it you know, the ripple effect happens. So it's like, you got to do all the online stuff, right? But do stuff off offline as well, you know, in the community. Be, be, I, a, I be a resource. This. Be a resource. If if, if you, it feels like your listener that uh, Greg listens to Guy and Conrad every single lunch hour legal market. Well, no. What this, is, what this? You got? I'm validating the advice you gave. I know this is the whole point. It's because we've been listening to you the whole time, right? Like no, this, no, no, you no. Completely you, right. It's this is, I and mean, we've we we've had entire shows on this concept, um, and and this is where this is where today's competitive advantage is. It isn't in the the page count of your website anymore, right? It's, right. It's in this, and that's and that's well, the change. I mean, I would say, um, I would say, you know, the the next 
the next episode or a bunch of episodes that you guys need to to focus on is, you know, everybody can't do everything. They can't be on TikTok and Instagram yeah. and and, you know, doing all the stuff in the community and having webinars and 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 running their business. You know, this is this is the pro- the problem that most practitioners have is like there's too many demands and not enough time. So the question becomes which of these cool things off of Google should you devote yourself to, you know? Just copy and paste chat GPT into your Facebook posts. <laughs> well, people Greg are doing Sterling. that. I know, sadly. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Greg, for listeners who want to learn more about all of the excellence that you're putting into the world, where should they head? So I got two things going. Nearmedia.co. Nearmedia.co. That's about search and local search. And then I got another new project called localdialogue.com. One word. And that's about AI and small business. Awesome. Well, we are so, so grateful that you joined us today. Great conversation. Uh, thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Uh, do check out Near Media. Check out their podcast, everything they do. I can't tell you enough about it. Uh, and we got a free time, free newsletter. Free newsletter for you. Newsletter. A lot of great resources at Near Media. Until next thank- time. Oh, go ahead, Greg. Say thank no, I was just going to thank you guys for having me. Just thanks oh, for having dude, thanks, me. Thanks for joining. Was, we are so awesome. grateful. Thank you so much. Until next time, Guy and Conrad, Lunch Hour Legal Marketing Market. Can't even do the close. Excellent. We haven't had a <laughs> blooper yet, and no one's sworn, so at least we have one blooper. <sighs> Until next time, Guy and Conrad signing off for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Money makes a money makes a it makes a world go round. Money makes a world go Yeah, money make a world go round. Yeah, money make a world go round.